please join me in welcoming our first speaker, who's uh, my co-founder, Des Trainer. Hi. It's great to see you all here. Well, I would say that if I could see you, but... <laughs> Normally, I speak about product at events like this, and that, you know, I, that's where most of my writing is. It's where a lot of the you know, work and thinking I do is. But I'm realizing these days that like, the, the quality of our product stuff, the quality of our design, it's like becoming less and less of a problem. We're building lots of products, and generally, the standard is raising. In fact, there's a product for most things these days. Uh, I was amused to find out that there is such a thing as Fitbit, but for cows. Uh, <laughs> it's like, no, I, actually, I should be correct myself here. There are two Fitbits for cows. Uh, the collectively, they've raised about $40 million, so there you go. The bovine category is hot. Um, there's also, I don't know if anyone saw the Airbnb for umbrellas that was launched recently. They, uh, they, this is no joke. They launched somewhere in Asia, and in their opening weekend, they lost 300,000 umbrellas and shut down. <laughs> now, I'm actually surprised they didn't raise a round, because that's 300,000 daily active users. They just need to monetize, but whatever, you know. Um, I guess uh, the bad product ideas aren't one clever talk or one you know, sneaky little job to be done away from being a great idea. And the great ideas are the ones we really want to see succeed, right? They're the ones that we want to actually scale and become massively impactful. Scaling a company in any way, once you get some sort of success, inherently means moving away from your initial skill set, the thing that actually motivated you and got you going to start it in the first place. Good product folks like yourselves we love to be close to the product, right? We love to just be in there and just deep in it. Anytime there's any problem in our business whatsoever, we can just roll up our sleeves and get in. No problem at all. But the, the challenge we have is that as our ideas flourish and as our ambitions kind of grow with them, we necessarily get further from the product. It's a necessary sort of evil in a sense. We're getting further from the thing that we're excited about. And that distance is necessary. You literally can't do it all yourself. So you get help. And here's what help looks like. You throw out some tweets and some LinkedIn's and you cross your fingers and people show up to work for, with you. Now, the, the nice thing here is they build exactly what you want the way you wanted it and you're done, right? <laughs> uh, if that was true, we would all be fucking billionaires and done. Uh, but that's not exactly what happens. Uh, it turns out that uh, there's a bit of a challenge here. What happens when you're over here and there's a problem in your favorite little project? Well. You typically, what you're, you all know what you're supposed to do, but in practice, we just roll our sleeves up and try and fix it, right? You know, if you're an engineer, you're going to try and engineer your way out of this problem. If you're a designer, you'll try and design your way out of this problem. If you're a product manager, you'll try and bullshit your way out of the problem. <laughs> it's, it's what we do. Uh, but if you do this enough, what happens is you start to choke up. You're starting to burn yourself out. You used to be great at one job, but now you're struggling to do two jobs or three jobs or four jobs. You're still trying to build the product, but what you need to be doing is building the team that builds the product. And that's when it hits you. No matter what the problem looks like, it's always a people problem. And that's what this talk is about. It's about people. So I'm going to talk about every lesson I've learned and what went right and wrong at every stage of, of sort of intercom, starting with like where it all started, if you like, the founding stage. This photo is of us the day we incorporated Intercom, August 15, uh, 2011. It's on the rooftop of 149 9th Street. Not a nice area. Um, but, but it worked. Uh, I'm sorry to anyone who lives there, by the way, I just realized. <laughs> um, but uh, in the last six years, uh, we've gone from, um, we've gone from the, these four happy people here uh, to being nearly 400 people thinking that if we just bring along 396 more people to spread the load, it'll get really easy. It doesn't. <laughs> the, so the first thing I'll talk about maybe is, is this founding stage. Right? The general advice when you're starting a company is basically you should have more than one founder. Don't do it alone. You need a shoulder to cry on. You need someone to share the burden. This is essential. But do you know what the, one of the biggest causes, I think it's the second biggest cause of, uh, of startup failure? It's the other fucking founders. <laughs> like, founder fallout happens for all sorts of reasons. And maybe one of them didn't realize it was going to be hard work. They thought it was all you know, tech parties and getting retweets from Gary Vee or some shit. You know, uh, maybe one of them wasn't as committed as the other. One of them thought it'd be easy. One of them thought it'd make them cool. Maybe they lied to each other. Maybe they lied to themselves about their motivations. Maybe everyone thought everyone was in charge and they were all going to be CEO. Maybe the relationship just fundamentally wasn't strong enough. Um, 
Uh, there's a quote by Paul Graham that I enjoy, which is, he said that startups will do to the relationship between founders what a dog will do to a sock. Rip it to pieces. <laughs> and uh, and I, that's definitely, I've, I've seen and witnessed this like many times. Uh, when I meet a company who are like, you're excited and they're looking for you to advise or invest or do whatever, uh, the first question, if I get any sniff of ambiguity about the founding story, the first question I ask is, hey, like, can you just tell me what the hierarchy is and what the responsibilities are? Like, who's in charge and who does what here? And if there's not a good quick answer there, what it means is there's going to be a long, slow fight. That's the only two options here. Because it means that they're usually avoiding decisions, and those decisions are so crucial. When we started Intercom, we'd worked together for three years before I'd worked with Owen for three years. We're coming up to our 10th year anniversary. Uh, I'll buy him a cake. But uh, we all knew what we were good at and what we were bad at. We all knew where our strengths and weaknesses uh, lie. But hierarchy is actually kind of easy to start with. It's absolutely agony to retrofit. And you will have to retrofit it. Startups in general, we absolutely love reinventing shit. Uh, management is definitely top of the pile, right? You got all these beautiful blog posts about managerless companies, flat companies, holocratic companies. You know, do you ever notice there's a point when all that just stops? <laughs> And, uh, and the reason it stops, I'm convinced, is because either the successful companies move away, mostly, and the ones that aren't successful where they weren't successful. And you could apply root cause analysis and work out where it was, but we'll never know. I, one thing I have seen consistently is I've had founders come to me and say, hey, will you spread this post? It's about why we don't need managers anymore in the new world. And I'm like, no, I don't really believe that. And then six months later, they're like, hey, Des, yeah? how, do you, uh, how do you get people to do things? I'm like, have you tried telling them? And they're like, no, I mean, you know, uh, we, we, that's not really how we work. And I'm like, hmm, well, I guess I'm stuck. Uh, so, so the question I like to ask companies is basically like, hey, all this like holacracy and no managers and no structure and no hierarchy and moving away from the sort of ways in which humans have grouped themselves for centuries, are you getting anything from this? Or is it, are you, like, if you're getting something from it, cool. But are you just trying to avoid a decision? Because if there's a decision you're avoiding, make that decision today because you don't want to have to make that after you've made your hires. You're, the next stage of a company is, if you like, your early hires. And that is like, you know, you, you don't want to be having the fights about who's doing what when they're on board because they're making a huge leap to join you and they really want to believe you have your shit together. So, you've, you know, the next stage I'll talk about is maybe these first few hires, right? The first few hires are probably the most influential decision you make after, like, what will we build and who will, build it, who will I build it with or whatever. Uh, in product land, where I'm kind of more comfortable speaking, I would normally say that when we, when we start uh, an, a new... Uh, when we start a new product, we want to have a core group of features that work together well and share a common vision to help people do things. And similarly, a company needs a core group of people that work together well and share a common vision to do things, right? In both cases, when you hit any sort of traction, it's what you add next that is literally defining. And it's so easy to get this wrong, right? In product land, getting it wrong is like you just sort of add features that sort of roughly do the job and they get a bit of traction and it all looks good. But if you do this enough, you actually, without thinking deeply about it, you forget what the fuck you were building in the first place. And here's the product equivalent of forgetting what you're building in the first place. I really like this GIF that I saw a while ago. So you can sort of see it's a pretty well thought out product. And then at some point, it starts to get a little bit funky, right? It's like, OK, I can kind of see how that half works. But uh, the point is, like, early hires can't do that to your company. They're like, they look like they're doing a job, but it wasn't the thing you set out to do, right? And next thing you know, you, you too can have a spider bike. And, uh, and what this is mostly about is alignment, right? You need to keep your team aligned, specifically aligned around three things, which is like, what are we doing, how are we doing it, and why are we doing it? And um, here's what I'm talking about. Like, you and your co-founders should be kind of by default aligned. You should have been on the same page about what you're doing, right? And your first few hires that join, well, they probably knew what they were joining. They probably knew you, or they, they had read like, what you were working on or whatever, so they're kind of usually on, on, you know, on the same page. Eventually, you're going to hire somebody who's a little bit off. Now, this is a really important point. If they are correct, as in they're saying, hey, I think we should be working harder, I think we should be working less, less hard, I think we should be taking the product this direction, you need to have this rationalization conversation now. You need to be open-minded about the fact that they could be correct, but if they're not correct, you need to be open, they need to be open-minded about the fact that they need to get on the fucking page. And, uh, and what that means is, like, if you don't correct it here, what happens is you'll scale it like this, because you'll use this one edge case to justify more. 
and then maybe you have a manager who's misaligned, and they go and hire a whole, a whole section. And next thing, there's a whole chunk of the org not working on the thing that you wanted them to work on. And that's the fundamental truth of alignment. Misaligned, pe misaligned people misaligned people. And it's not their fault, by the way, it's yours. Forgetting to pe keep like, your team aligned and on the same page is probably the biggest mistake you'll make at this stage. But because this shit's so hard and because this tier is called Lessons Learned, uh, here's the five more mistakes that I'm quite familiar with. Uh, Next one is like hiring on reputation without verifying ability. I think what happens here is uh, people are like, we have to go and design our desk, he's awesome, he's ex Twitter, ex Palantir, ex Dropbox, ex Groupon. I'm like, wow, he got fired a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but you know, like that is, it's a stellar looking LinkedIn profile, don't get me wrong, right? Uh, similarly, like uh, thinking that you can add great people to the mix later. Uh, this is like, you know, hey, look, we can't hire, we can't hire any superstars now, but like we'll compromise on quality now and then they'll join later. Which means that the, the presumption here is that some absolute like, hero is going to show up and she'll look at your team and go, wow, that's a lot of mediocrity. Thank God you waited for me. <laughs> Doesn't work. Um, another one is um, related to this area of compromise is like, uh, making excuses for assholes. Uh, this is a really common thing, unfortunately. Yes, exactly. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Preach. Uh, there, there, there is one redeeming quality of an asshole. There's one redeeming quality. One thing I like about them. They will always tell you that they're an asshole. They can't fucking help it. You could be in a meeting and you've got the whole team psyched about something and you look around and you're like, oh, and the, oh you forgot about me. <laughs> and like, they'll just, they, if they eschew it. They can't help themselves. They'll tell you in their interview. They'll say things like, oh yeah, the last company, they didn't know, they didn't appreciate my brilliance, you know. You know they will let you know if all you need to do is listen. That's all. Uh, a fourth mistake is like hiring people who can't adapt. And because startups going through any stage of growth, everything tomorrow is different than today. You might have been 10 people last month and you could be like 50 people in three months' time. And if somebody's not okay with the fact that the hierarchy is going to change, the roles are going to change, responsibilities are going to change, you're going to move from these like Swiss Army knife people at the start to sort of scalpels at the end. Uh, if they're not okay with that, it's, they shouldn't be in a startup. If they need that much stability in their role, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's not going to work out. And lastly, just forgetting about new hire onboarding. So it's so easy to actually think that everyone who, just, who shows them your company is just going to know where their desk is, know, know what the strategy is, and just work out everything immediately. And they don't need to talk to you at all, and you don't need to invest time in them. Do this, and what happens is they basically spend two months, they're like, oh, you know what, screw this, I'm gone. And that's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a common mistake to people, because usually you haven't hired that many people, you don't know what it's like to start another company, and new hire onboarding is key, but people get it wrong all the time. So if you can avoid those mistakes, that might get you through your 10 to 15 hires, and then you're going to look around, you're going to go, like, Jesus Christ, this is a big company. This is much bigger than we ever thought it was going to be. And that's when you start to look at your org chart. And your org chart basically will show you over time that you're going to go from a team to teams to teams of teams. That's basically uh, how companies scale, in my, in my experience and my opinion. And you do this because you need to keep getting out of this everyone does everything sort of situation, which is where you start. But every now and then, you need to break up and be like, all right, maybe not everyone has to do the same thing. Let's split into roles and functions. Another reason you do it is because the relationships and the, the sort of communication gets really complex. You see, when we were four people, it was very simple. We just had four people, and there's actually six relationships within a group of four people, right? We all had to talk to each other. Thankfully, we all liked each other, and it worked. But this scales really quickly. When we were six people, it, immediately it's like 15. And even a team as small as 14 people has 91 relationships, right? And what that looks like is, and by the way, like this is what a, if you wanna, ever want to know what a 14-person Slack channel looks like, that's actually what it looks like. Uh, <laughs> the problem here is one of interdependence versus independence, right? Interdependence means everyone has to wait for everything else. This sort of hive mind has to converge on things. Independence means people can move at their own speed. Speed is the thing you need most, so you need to fight to keep this independence. It'll, it can be a little bit chaotic, it can mean occasionally people are on different pages, but it is so much faster and speed is of the essence. So the lessons I'd offer you, especially if you're in this sort of uh, team's stage, is fight for independence. Look for people who are held back because they need to just wait for a whole heap of other people to work things out. Free them. Secondly, um, don't try and preempt any of it. You might watch this talk and be like, all right, team, we're going to split up everyone. And we're, you know, you're all going to go into different rooms because Des Trainer said so. You know, that's actually not the right thing to do. Uh, what you'll get is uh, you'll get a lot of pushback. If you, 
you're much better off letting things break and then everyone's bought in on the solution. I say that on product land, product land all the time. I say, look, we can't sell people on a solution if they haven't bought the problem, right? So wait until people are bought in on the problem, and then you can be like, all right, well, I'm, I'm glad you agree. Here, here's what we're going to do. And thirdly, as you start to do things like this in your company, not everyone loves it. Welcome to management. You'll have teams and managers, and you never wanted that. You just wanted to build a cool little Fitbit for cows, right? Um, <laughs> So we've gone from a team to teams to teams to teams. And the job here then becomes to be one of management. You're effectively managing managers, and you sort of have to start thinking about how do we assess and how do we get good at management. And as you'd guess, you're going to make an absolute ball to this as well. Uh, so there's like a few mistakes that I've seen sort of consistently. Um, one of them is like assuming that some person who is best at something should be the manager of something, right? Assuming that like your best designer should manage all of your design, and your best engineer should manage all of your engineering. The, the, like that basically pays no respect to the actual, the really, really noble craft of management. Management being motivating people, leading people, giving feedback, guiding them through their career. You're basically saying none of that shit matters. It's, all you need to be is deadly at sketch, and you're sorted, you know? Uh, <laughs> The second mistake is not learning how to interview for managers. So like, if your criteria turns into, well, I searched LinkedIn for a manager, and I got this guy, and it sounds like he can manage. Uh, that's not how it works. Uh, thirdly, if you decide to promote somebody into management, have you trained them? Have you like, let them know what the role involves? Have you given them the skills they need? And lastly, uh, a key piece is like, you're now, for you to work effectively, you have to look at teams. That's the basic unit of analysis. Not people, not features, but teams. Teams is how you need to think about it. This last piece is kind of cliched, but it's cliched for a good reason. It's very common. Uh, Patrick Lencioni wrote this famous book that we're all going to pretend we've read, but we haven't. It's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And uh, in it, he says, basically, all great teams are, have five characteristics. They have trust. If a team don't trust each other, it's not safe to admit you don't know something. It's not safe to say things like, hey, I'm going to screw this one up, but I think you're better at it. There has to be trust for conversations like that. There has to be conflict in a team. It has to be okay to fight. It has to be okay to say, I don't think this is the right decision. Otherwise, the least offensive decisions get made all the time, and that usually looks like mediocrity. Uh, you need commitment. Can people commit to what it is that they're working on? Uh, even if they don't necessarily, even if they lost the debate, can they commit? And accountability. So if someone's not performing, will they be held accountable either by their peers, by their customers, by their manager? Is there any reason to perform at your best? Because if there's not, Gravity drags performance down. And lastly, results. Can they access results that tell them if they're doing a good job frequently or not? And I don't mean that means you show up on a Friday and say, mm, good job. I mean that they should be able to tell independently, objectively, am I performing well? Are we performing well? So that's, you know, that's how we, you know, certainly I've learned to assess teams, and it's, 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 a, it's a hard craft, but it's so important. So are you all still with me? Yeah? OK, cool, cool. I can only see two people in the front row, and they look like they're in it. Uh, but uh, I'm just going to talk about one more thing, and it's kind of like maybe the darker of the topics, which is managing for performance, AKA firing people. Uh, and yes, uh, for some reason, no one ever wants to talk about this. And that's the reason why we're all so bad at it. It's the reason why it's such a, a, a messy, dirty word. And, uh, and, I, and I just think it's worth being a bit more open about this. Uh, an example, or sort of the analogy I often use, again, just going back to product land, is that like, if, when someone like, releases a feature in a product, you generally have an expectation of it performing well and getting really popular over time. Here's what that would look like. And if you release the feature and it doesn't maybe perform as well, or maybe, maybe it just didn't keep pace with the performance of the rest of the product, or whatever, you have to ask questions. I, you'd be talking to a product manager saying, hey, what's the improvement plan here? How are we going to get this adopted? Why is it not performing? Have we given it the best chance it needs to succeed? Did we advertise it well? Did we promote it well? And, uh, and like you take all the circumstances into account and you put together a, a plan. You sort of say, let's get this thing to where it needs to be, right? The exact same thing happens with people, right? If someone isn't performing at the level you need them to, you have to have an open, honest conversation. But like, hey, look, I want to work with you on basically a way that you can get performing to the level we need you at, that's in a time frame that's respectable to your career and your ambitions, and also our company and what we need to get done. And that is occasionally known as a dreaded performance improvement plan, a.k.a. PIP. But it's an important conversation to have because you know, the people who don't talk about these things, they have two other things they do instead. The first one is pretty cruel. They never give the feedback. They never have the chat. They just one day show up and boop, you're fired. And that's terrible because you've never given a person a single chance to get good. 
A single chance, right? The reason you do that is because you're scared of having to have a hard chat with them. So you say, oh, you know what? I'll just fire them and then I never have to see them again. Perfect, right? Uh, that's what you do when you're scared, when you're, you're literally prioritizing your own feelings over the right thing for the you, the right thing for the company, the right thing for the person. The worst thing than that is you never fire them, you never give them the feedback, and you let them piss away the best years of their career in your company. And that's horrendous. And unfortunately, that is, a, is a, quite a default route, especially if you haven't invested in making sure your managers know what you're doing. So the best advice I'd offer you when it gets to this piece is, is have these chats with people. Let it, let it be known that this is how your company works, if this is indeed how your company works. Let people know that, hey, we're going to evaluate everyone on their impact, and we're going to evaluate everyone on their behavior, too. Because behavior, as we've learned all too recently in this industry, is behavior is so fucking important. And you know, I often tell people, like, there's a simple graph you can use here, right? Uh, you can look at behavior and you can look at impact. And here's you as a founder up here. You know, we're all fucking perfect, right? We never put a foot wrong, okay? We're the most productive people who behave perfectly, as we all, you know, we wish. Um, and you hire a few waves of people, and ideally all these people are, you know, they're all pretty much, you know, good hitters too. And eventually you start to get, uh, you'll get a hire or two where you start to test your limits, right? And, and these limits that you're going to test, uh, these ask you questions like, What's the worst behavior you'll tolerate uh, in your company if the person's high impact? What's the lowest productivity you'll tolerate for a cultural powerhouse who really gels the teams together? Now, like all limits in life, you'll really only know them when you've gone past them. And that's just the nature of it, right? And the, the thing you should know about behavior in your company is that all behavior scales. So if this is good behavior, medium, and bad, here's what you get when you blow up your company. Now, if you can stamp this shit out now, early on, you don't actually have to deal with it later on. Because that's, you, know, you basically put the principles and the values in place, and it means that like, you, you have so much less to worry about because you've never tolerated this. You don't have to make these you know, judgments every single day. So that's it. That's the people lessons I've learned as we've gone from four to almost 400. Maybe next year I'll come back and talk about product, but I think this shit's actually really important. And I don't think we talk about it enough. Our industry, we tend to celebrate growth, and we tend to idolize founders who achieve massive growth and massive valuations. Then we act so shocked when it turns out that if you take like a 20-something college kid who's never had a job and never had a boss and never worked anywhere good, and you make them the CEO of a thousand-person company over the space of two years, and it turns out that they didn't create a great working environment for 995 other people. <laughs> you know, why did we think they would? But uh, we obsess over like, the growth and the valuations and the metrics and all that sort of shit. We don't talk about people until it's too late. All growth eventually decays. All products get disrupted. It's the nature of our industry. That's the way it works. So it's worth asking, when you think of your own company, what is it you'll leave behind when your product is disrupted, when your growth has plateaued? Intercom has the metrics, the funding, the revenue, but that's, that, that's not all a great company is made of. Uh, Own, a CEO you just heard, often says, great companies are composed of three ingredients, the product, the profit, and the people. And here's what that looks like. All are essential. And the more I think about it, you have to carefully consider the order you work with, right? Here's one way you could look at it. You could say, it's actually, if you get the people, the people will make the product. If you can get the product, the product will make the profit. And the reason I care about this is because I had a realization a while ago. As you cross every year that you work in Intercom, uh, we get you a custom comic done. We have a few people on staff who are phenomenal comic artists. Uh, we call them Intercomics. Don't ask why. Um, <laughs> we do this to celebrate and acknowledge the, the massive contributions that people have made. And we hang them on the walls of our offices, in all of our offices. That I can show you some of them here, actually. So here's, uh, here's Emmett, who you'll hear later, uh, Sabrina, who's on after myself, uh, that's Matt, who's also speaking tonight, and lastly, it's Megan, whose show this entire thing is. Um, <laughs> I'm not there, you can stop looking. <laughs> uh, but as I walk past the, these in, the, in our offices, as I like, look at them on the walls, I realize there's something that actually lasts a lot longer than MRR or products or traction or blog posts or any of that shit. The media narrative was always to simplify uh, you know, companies down to like the founder, like, oh, he was a college dropout, or she was a college dropout who did this or that. But that's such a gross simplification of what it takes. Intercom would actually be nothing without these people. I've spent nearly a quarter of my life on Intercom at this stage, which is scary to realize, but it is true. And when I think about why I love doing it and why I'm going to do it for as long as I can imagine, it's actually not about the products and about the revenue and all that sort of It's actually because I got to work with 
and work alongside all of these amazing folks. And that's actually been the honor of my career. It's all about the people. Thank you.